Hi, I'm Dario Cortez. Berkeley College believes that all citizens need to be informed about the important issues that affect our daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and the partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the PNC Foundation, which receives its principal funding from the PNC Financial Services Group. PNC supports early childhood education through PNC Grow Up Great, a $350 million multi-year initiative that began in 2004 to help prepare children from birth to age five for success in school and life. The Russell Berry Foundation and by PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. This is One on One. That's good acting, man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a fool for you, man! I get that a lot. I go to Atlantic City all the time, like, are you the guy? I go, no, I'm not. This is one you can't afford to miss. They thought that I wouldn't survive it, but I knew I would. This is why I love this show. You're about to meet one of our good friends. She actually came back after the last time, which is fascinating, because I'm usually mean to people. You're never mean. You're I'm, wonderful. No, I, yeah, some people <laughs> think otherwise. We have Dr. Jeanette Bencourt, Senior Vice President for Outreach and Educational Practices at the Great Sesame Workshop. Good to see you. It's nice to be here. Thank you. We had a great time last time. I learned so much. Um, just want to make it clear. Explain to folks the difference between Sesame Workshop and Sesame Street. Ah, it's a wonderful organization. The organization is actually Sesame Workshop. And Sesame Street is one of the many things that we produce. It's a nonprofit organization whose mission is to use media to help children reach their highest potential. And this is part of our uh, Grow Up Great initiative we're doing in cooperation with our friends mm -hmm. at PNC. Absolutely. Let's, PNC Bank, can we plug some of the great things you're doing? Um, I like this one, Food for Thought, right? This is Eating Well on a Budget. Talk about this because this is getting distributed all over. Millions of these, right? Absolutely. How many? We have close to 5 million kits in total that have been distributed around our healthy habits. This being part of it. This is a kit. It's a kit, but it's much more. It's an initiative. And this initiative is actually focusing on food insecurity or hunger here in the U.S. Who do they go to? They go to organizations, community organizations, that reach families really within their communities. And it's a resource that helps them look at two things. One, how to keep nutrition and physical activity in their lives with their children, but also how to do it in an economic way. What do you mean? Well, what hunger is, or food insecurity, is really children and families not having adequate access to nutritious foods, as well as not having the economics or the funds to purchase those foods. Let's talk about some of the, I'm sorry for interrupting, let's no, talk about please. some of the other initiatives that you're particularly proud of. And by the way, let's keep putting up the website. Uh, the reason we, we're doing this Grow Up Great initiative is because we want to make sure, uh, again, we have three small children grew up mm -hmm. on Sesame Street and yeah. Sesame Workshop, part of a larger family. Um, we want our kids to grow up great, right? Absolutely. Let's talk about some of the other initiatives that you're most proud of. It's really the approach of the whole child. So each initiative is really built on how can we help children grow in terms of their general learning, or how can we help special populations such as military families yeah, let's talk about go military through families. the transitions that they regularly go through. For example, military families go through multiple transitions, deployment, sometimes a parent returns changed because of a combat-related injury, or the greatest loss, which is the death of a parent. Mm. So we create tools that help children, and particularly within the context of their families, cope with those transitions. What are the role, what's the role of the, the Muppets in that whole process? We were just, oh, uh, Natalie, mm -hmm. put, up, uh, put that shot up again if we could, guys. When we're talking about uh, a military family, mm -hmm. the role of the Muppets in this whole process, we're looking at uh, the great Elmo right there. The great Elmo. And basically what the Muppets do is represent the child's point of view. It's really the kind of questions that they would ask. And we model the way you can respond to those questions. So in dealing with grief, sometimes the question a child may have is, my daddy or mommy coming back? Mm. So we explain the concept of death, again, in a child-friendly and appropriate way. 
but it models for both children and adults. Let's talk about some of the other initiatives. Um, we were getting ready for the show. I was thinking about um, the fact that language is a big issue, correct? Absolutely. Talk about language. Well, language in the context of helping families across really talk to one another across issues. But language in the context of what we were saying before, really helping children understand very odd and strong concepts. For example, how does when a parent returns change through a combat-related injury, an invisible injury like traumatic brain injury, how do you explain that and how do you do it in a child-friendly way and also a way that helps the child understand mm -hmm. the changes in the adult? The other thing that's fascinating beyond language is, is, is international awareness, global awareness, yes. you know, AIDS awareness in Africa, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, HIV related issues, that the SESME yeah. workshops involved in that. Well, How what, so? What's fascinating is that we're in over 120 countries and in around 25 What are we looking at right there? Countries. Is that South Africa? That is South Africa and that is a fun, wonderful Muppet which, whose name is Cami. Cami. And Cami is in really an HIV positive Muppet. And again, it's designed to the country's needs. So that Muppet didn't come from here, from the States, or from our model here in, in, in the US. But it was really, how do we meet the needs of children in South Africa? And what are their needs, both educationally and also in terms of their social emotional development? Let me ask, ask you something. I'm curious about this. Do you think? that there's something about the people who are drawn professionally to your organization? Who are they? Where do they come from? Such a wonderful question. It, it really is a collective of individuals there who are creative, very committed to the mission of Sesame Workshop, but most of all, they really understand children. They understand the way children enjoy themselves, but also the way that they learn. And really, everyone, no matter if you're in the finance department, in your outreach, digital, each of them possess that vision and those abilities. Is that how you got into this? Oh, I got into this really in a way that I didn't think I would work at Sesame Workshop. You did? That wasn't your Not game plan? All. No, I was a speech and language pathologist. And I worked. Where'd you grow up? I, oh, I have a fun um, upbringing. I was born here in the States, but my parents are from Columbia, South America, and I would shuttle back and forth all the time. And eventually I got interested really in working with children and helping them therapeutically. And coincidentally, a friend of mine actually said, why don't you come over and consult at the workshop? They're looking at really some materials for special needs children. And so I came in and I go, wow. Just like a lot of people, you don't recognize the power and the many things that you can do at Sesame Workshop. It's interesting. In the time we have left, the reaction you get, not just from the children who you serve, but their families, mm -hmm. whether it's military families mm -hmm. or uh, families who are struggling with HIV and AIDS, right. what kind of reaction do you get? We get the reaction of how this wonderful brand and these wonderful Muppets really live with families in terms of lifelong. So many individuals, if they're adults, they share their family experiences and also the experiences as a child, their favorite Muppet. So it's really a lifelong history with the Muppets and it's just wonderful. You love your work. Can you tell? <laughs> yeah, you're very yes, passionate. I am. And uh, we are honored. Um, Dr. Battencourt, every time you've come on, we've learned something new. And uh, you inspire us and remind us why um, Sesame Street, uh, the mm -hmm. show itself, the series itself, but also the folks at the Sesame Workshop are doing important work. And, and we all hope that all of our kids, whether they're our own children or um, our children of the world, grow up great. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us on One on One. Thank you. Folks, stay with us. We all want our kids to grow up really great. Stay with us we'll right back after this. Thanks, Janine. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org and visit us online at oneonone.org. There he is, Ken D'Amato, who is the president and chief executive officer of Domain. First of all, it's a great name. We'll put it up there so people can see how it's spelled. Uh, and also, what is it, Domain? 
Thank you. Domain is a family website that teaches children about money. We're the first and only free website that brings together financial education and family organization in one website. Where the heck did this idea come from? I was watching my, my older boy Michael and David play Webkins and Club Penguin and while they were playing Webkins I was watching how my, at the time David who was nine, how he was spending the web dollars as quickly as he can get them in and buying everything whether he needed it or not. <laughs> he had 15 you know, palm trees in a room yes. and Michael was saving everything so he was proud to accumulate. And I'm thinking to myself, we do the same exact thing with both children, how can they be so different? And it's basically some of it's just the way they the, the way they're wired, but others the environment. You know, Michael likes saving, and David still to this day will spend everything and always wonder why he doesn't have money. <laughs> so, you said to yourself, by the way, what's your background that you would come into this like this? So I am a uh, Fortune 100 executive. I started at General Electric in the lighting business, and ended up in private equity, uh, you know, running portfolio companies. And I was just watching my kids in Christmas time, 2008 playing these games and I thought, wow, there's gotta be a better way to teach, teach kids about money. So I, while I was still running, running a portfolio of companies for a private equity firm, I started to spend some money and have some people do some research and found out that there were thousands of websites to teach children about money using gameplay, but what parent would ever have the time to vet through 100 websites to find right. the right one? So I engaged some teachers to actually start working on a project with me and in 2009, in the fourth quarter, I put together a business plan and sold it into a couple of private investors and built out a team. And two years later, you know, we've been five months live. You know, tens of thousands of people are coming to the site each week. They're signing up, and it's working. That's great. So if someone logs on, right? What happens? So you go to domain.com, and you will see it's basically geared towards parents. So you'll see... Not kids? Well, the domain site is geared towards parents because there are laws in terms of having children right. sign Got up it. for things. So domain is all basically what's called brochureware. You have to have a parent sign up and then you open up all of these tools that come for free, there's no charge, and you get access immediately to a family calendar, a chores tracker, allowance tool. If you don't believe in having money be used in your, in your household, you can use points. We have a points bank, a virtual, and where it gets neat, similar to what PNC does with their virtual wallet for older children, we can import bank accounts into our website so children in a clear, concise way can see their money in a safe environment. What happens when, when kids see this? What kind of reaction? They're, they get excited about it because most parents don't let children just use the computer easily and, and, and have free reign of it. Right. So we bring together financial education, but we do it through gameplay on age-relevant properties. So when you create a domain, if kids have access to click on games and it takes them to individual websites depending on how old they are and what they play. So we have three properties that feed from domain on the public and the private side. And the public is if you just go and don't sign up for an account, kids can go and play games all day long for free. And the Fun Vault teaches children needs versus wants, coin recognition, relative value. I mean, a child can learn how many, how many you know, slices of pizza it would take to actually you know, cost to li versus lighting a house, an electric bill. And there's games that teach these children these kind of things. And they've all been brought to the, brought to, uh, the marketplace through teachers and game developers. You know, it's interesting. You, you've said publicly in the past that money has become invisible to our kids. What does that mean? So think about, think about 20 years ago, 25 years ago when we were teenagers. And you would go to the bank. You'd watch your parents go to the bank. You'd watch them pay bills. You'd watch them open up an envelope and, and, and look shocked when they see how little <laughs> money they had or pay credit cards to today. So today, a child in this generation sees us go to an ATM machine That's and it right. spits out money. You can pull up to a Dunkin' Donuts and get a cup of coffee or a McDonald's and a Happy Meal and they pull out a piece of plastic. And children don't see currency moving back and forth. And then you make it even more complicated by parents aren't doing, they're doing their banking online. They're not opening up bills. They're paying bills online. So, you know, children grow up today and they don't even know anything about but, money. But what should we be doing? Can I help me? Because I worry about this with our kids. I mean, our, <laughs> our kids are, uh, we have a big boy, he's 19 in college and he's, he's trying to figure out, he knows his tuition gets paid for and his job is to work hard with his grades and part-time jobs and things. But again, he's not expected to pay his tuition. It's Correct. a big bill. But then you've got a seven and a nine-year-old 
trying to figure out where this stuff's coming from, and you try to have them be responsible, but spoiled, no doubt about it. And a little girl who's 18 months. What's my job? <laughs> Isn't my job, devil's advocate, to make it easier on my kids than my parents made it for me, who, no disrespect, my parents watch occasionally, they couldn't do anything <laughs> for us. They really it's, could. It's a different generation, right? Right. I mean, when we were kids, our parents said, go outside and don't come you back figure until, it out. until it's dark. Right. Well, it's different. So today, it really is our responsibility to teach our children. So in this world where you know, money is ubiquitous, it's invisible, right? So how do, you do, how do you do the right thing? Well, you made a comment about being spoiled, but I would bet that you're doing everything to teach them to, that they're privileged, but not grow up spoiled. In words. But I don't know what else to do other than, first of all, I'm not good at saying no. Should we be saying no more? Absolutely. I don't want to get overly, overly philosophical, but Absolutely. I know I don't say no enough. Absolutely. Do you? Absolutely. You're good at that. I have no choice but to. And you know, see, here's my heart. You've done well professionally, obviously, right? Yes. Isn't it harder to say no because you can? So, <laughs> so fortunately, so I grew up in New Jersey, in right. a blue-collar town in Sayreville, New Jersey, and my... My parents, you know, allowed me to get to school, but I paid for my college education. Yep. You and did. And I worked it. the whole time. Yep. And today, I would actually say I would want my children to be working in school. Yeah. I mean, I'll pay their education, but just like you said, your your yep. your nineteen year old job is to yep. work. So and get good grades. And good grades. As long as I know he's working hard. Exactly. Right. So again, so you're doing it. You're you're making them go out a little bit too. So where the, where the challenge is, is you have to, how do you teach the kids and how do you make it real, relevant? How does Domain help them do that? Other than the big, I'm sorry for bringing no, in it's my okay. kids. It's okay, but it's a great it's, story. It's real. Good. So first of all, you have to actually incorporate money into your world. Good. So what Domain does is it allows you to actually teach children early on by deciding, teach them about doing, using chores and allowance. So you know today, most parents say, oh, I've tried chores and allowance. It never works. Is there a chore chart on the website? Well, absolutely. There's a chores tracker that's very similar it. to what the, what the refrigerator has. Right? So we don't actually, we have a family calendar. So everyone can put their things on one calendar. You can import into our website very easily with a couple of keystrokes, the school calendar, the kids' chores. You can have them put their piano lessons on. And maybe each of your children have responsibility to load onto the, their calendar. So you could see it from your PDA what they're supposed to do. And at the end of the week, if they do their chores and submit it to mom and dad, they can have their allowance given, and then there's a record that you've paid them. I love So it this. teaches responsibility in a fun, engaging way. I can do this you can do it right for my now. kids right away. Right away. You will help me do this after the show. Absolutely. And it will help my kids become more financially responsible. Immediately. And better citizens. <laughs> Ken D'Amato is the president and chief executive officer of DOE, D-O-U-G-H, Maine. This is great stuff. Thank you. And by the way, I heard that you were really caught up with money in his 11-year-old, and it's paid off, <laughs> not just because you're a good entrepreneur, successful, because you're making a difference for others. Hey, thank you, Ken. Thank you're you so much. You're a great guest. Appreciate it. One-on-one, -on -one, you never know what you're going to learn here. Manage money for yourself, and more, more, more importantly, having your kids become more financially responsible and grow up great. We'll be right back. Hey, that was great. Thank man. you so much. If you would like more information on this program, or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. And visit us online at oneonone.org. Ada Beth Cutler, Dean of Montclair State University's College of Education and Human Services. Good to see you, Dean. Good to see you, Steve. I am a proud graduate of Montclair State University. Uh, and by the way, one of the finest programs we have is the College of Education and Human Services. Uh, one of the areas I want to talk to you about right away is teacher quality, right? We're struggling in this area. Uh, has it, has, is it, a bigger area than ever before, meaning is it harder to measure quality? Is it, um, are teachers not as good as before? What's going on? That's a really good question. I don't think it's that teachers aren't as good as they were before, but we have higher expectations for all of the students in our school now. There was a time when we were growing up when it was acceptable and even possible to drop out of high school and still make a living and support your family. It's not possible anymore. And we pay attention to all of the children in our schools, whether they have special needs, whether they don't speak English at home, whether they come from backgrounds of poverty, and all of them deserve a good education. So the challenges are greater. How has teacher preparation changed? Ah, teacher preparation has changed a great deal in many places, including at Montclair State University, although we have a long and illustrious history of producing outstanding teachers for New Jersey schools. We've been rated in the top 20 in teacher preparation in the country. 
by U.S. News and World Report and other organizations. There are some reasons, obviously, why we're rated mm -hmm. so highly and we've gotten many accolades. First of all, our students learn the subject matters they're going to teach very well, very deeply. And that is a basis for the rest of their education. We don't accept people into teacher preparation when they come in as freshmen. They have to apply as juniors to teacher preparation. Then when they're in our teacher preparation program, whether at the undergraduate or the graduate level, we immerse them in the schools in what we call clinical experiences. Mm. People used to talk about practice teachers. You probably remember yes. from your experience. That is necessary but insufficient if a prospective teacher only spends one semester at the end of the program in a school, it really is inadequate to then come in and take over a class on your own. We also have very close partnerships with school districts. Give us an example. Well, <coughs> Newark. Newark is a big piece of this, Newark I Newark is a very big piece of this. Montclair State is not an ivory tower institution. Not at all. We are deeply engaged in the communities is that, that part, surround sorry, us. Sorry, is that the urban residency program? Ah, that is the new, Newest and most exciting program we have in our partnership with the Newark Public Schools. Talk about it. Please, I'm happy to. The Urban Teacher Residency is modeled after a medical residency program where prospective teachers, and these are postgraduate, they already have their bachelor's degree when they enter this program. They go through a rigorous, very rigorous admissions process. They want to teach in the city of Newark and they want to be career long teachers and they are very high achieving individuals. They come into the program, they spend an entire year in the school with a talented and carefully selected mentor teacher. It's like an apprenticeship program and at mm. the same time they're earning a master's degree, a master of arts in teaching from us. Our faculty deliver that program in the schools. They coach them in the schools. They coach the mentors. They work with the principals on school improvement, on teaching for deep learning. And it is a very, very successful program. It's funded by a $6.3 million federal grant that right. Montclair State got. Department the largest, of Education? Yes. Sometimes U.S. Department. Sometimes people question the Federal Department of Education. Hey, what do they do? That's a good answer, right? That's one of the things they do. Yes, it is. It is one of the things they do. And they are actually very much engaged in thinking about what it will take to have a high-performing teacher in every classroom. So Secretary Arnie Duncan and others engaged in this as well? Yes, absolutely. Is, is there private money here, or is it, or is it all government that's money? A, that's a good question. The, the majority of the money is from the federal grant, but it requires a 100% match. So the Newark Public Schools puts up money. The residents get a living stipend. They get $26,000 for the year, and their master's degree is totally paid for. So the Newark Public Schools puts up half the stipend. The grant pays half. Montclair State has, puts up part of the tuition money for this program. We also have money from the Prudential Foundation that right. has enabled us to do certain things. There are other um, federal grants. We, we have bought digital backpacks for all of the residents that have all of the technology they need in one backpack. Um, you know, there is a metaphor that people often use that teacher quality is like a leaking sw leaky swimming pool, that we keep pouring more teachers into the pool and even though some don't make it, we just keep pouring more in. And there's an enormous expense to that. One, one um, statistic is that half of all teachers leave after the first five years on Why? the job. There are a few reasons. One is some are ill-prepared. and They really should never have gone. I, I'll say this, but is this correct? That they should not have gone in the first place? Or they could have made it, but something caused them not to. It's both of those, actually. Okay. But I think the greater factor is what happens when they're on the job. There is a very sad fact that in many schools, new teachers are given the most difficult assignments, mm. and they don't get the kind of support they need. Think about first-year lawyer, law associates, supervised, right. clinical psychologists, sure. social workers. There's a lot of mentoring. Right, a lot of mentoring. Where's the mentoring here? Ah, in our urban teacher residency program, there is a very extensive mentoring program for three years, not for one year, All for three, three years. Right. And they have to sign a contract that they will teach in the Newark Public Schools for a minimum of three years. In one year of the urban teacher residency program at Eastside High School, the mathematics scores, because the high school program is math and science teachers, the math scores went up from 50% proficient to 64% proficient. So you're actually seeing 
from a quantitative point of view, real results. Yes, we are. These are passionate, talented young people who are being mentored by excellent, experienced teachers and our faculty. Question, a couple of minutes we have left. What should, in your opinion, the debate, the discussion around teachers, teacher performance sound like? Because it often doesn't sound mm -hmm. the way I'd like it to sound. Not forget about what I like it to sound. It awfully doesn't sound, often doesn't sound productive or constructive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What should it sound like? Well, I think it's, it's unproductive to make it a blame game. You know, there are many factors that, uh, that affect student achievement. The most important in-school factor is the teacher. But teachers need to feel appreciated and respected and honored in our society, and too often they're not. They also need opportunities to learn on the job. We treat teachers as though once they graduate and they start teaching, they know everything they need to know. Mm -mm. They can't. It's the beginning of a teaching journey. I remember how bad I was at this 20 <laughs> years ago. I mean, really bad. And we, 15 years ago, I mean, I mean, the point is, you just, I'm sorry, and also, also I'd taken time cues poorly because I didn't realize the show was ending. Uh, <laughs> Ada Beth C Cutler is the uh, Dean of the Montclair State University College of Education and Human Services. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the PNC Foundation, which receives its principal funding from the PNC Financial Services Group. PNC supports early childhood education through PNC Grow Up Great, a $350 million multi-year initiative that began in 2004 to help prepare children from birth to age five for success in school and life. The Russell Berry Foundation and by PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. There is a place that pushes beyond traditional thinking to take medicine further than ever before where science and creativity work together to give heart and cancer patients new possibilities. And researchers discover options for children who once had none. A place that proves every day that impossible is just an opinion. Hackensack University Medical Center, where medicine meets innovation. Don't miss Steve Adubato and co-host Raphael P. Rahman each week on New Jersey Capital Report. Airing on NJTV 13 and WHYY. Check your local listings.